welcome. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I've only got a couple of slides to take you through in terms of um, what I think is really going to be a, a massive market and opportunity, not just in South Africa, but in, in Africa more generally. We really are on the um, on the verge of, of a major revolution in terms of energy. We're really seeing that. I mean, it's, it's really well in progress. Um, my presentation really just touched on the energy landscape, what it means for South African distributors, um, very briefly just in terms of the IRP, and then finishing with some recent analysis that we've been doing in terms of what is the uh, job and localization opportunity, specifically with, for example, a, a scenario of a certain amount of SSEG deployment in South Africa. I think just put some some um, numbers to, to, to some of the debate and discussion. I think this is a slide that, that, that we all now know pretty well, um, really just showing what's been happening globally in terms of uh, specifically wind and PV deployment. I mean, for the last 100 years, we've, we've deployed a lot of, for example, hydro, a run of, run of river and, and pump storage, um, uh, energy storage, and uh, in the last 10 years, seen you know, a dramatic uh, increase in the amount of wind and PV um, and a massive cost reduction, uh, largely spanned through just simply the industrialization of the large-scale manufacturing of these uh, technologies. Um, a lot of that infrastructure has then been um, deployed within uh, the developed uh, economies. Very interesting, uh, China being a relatively late adopter, but now massive player in terms of renewable energy. Um, so they were very strategic in terms of um, using markets and in, in the likes of uh, Germany and the UK to be able to uh, use that to, to upscale their manufacturing of wind and PV technology. Um, went through a huge amount of cost reduction in the process um, and when those technologies then started to become very cost protective without requiring subsidies, um, the Chinese, for example, now have started to deploy massive amounts of wind and PV at all levels. Um, and that's just a, a global mega trend that we're seeing internationally. Um, that's reflected, so many of you know this slide by now very well, um, in terms of um, the cost reductions that we've seen in our own uh, renewable energy procurement program run by the, the DOE and implemented by the IPP office. Massive cost reductions in both wind and PV, and particularly PV, um, with last rounds closing in, in 2015 at around about 65 cents, South African cents. Um, but that cost curve would have dropped even more or further in the last three to four years. Um, so we would probably realistically be procuring renewable energy in South Africa, wind and PV, somewhere between 50 to maximum 60 cents a kilowatt hour. So so highly, highly cost competitive. Obviously, uh, not the only solution needs to be complemented by a range of other flexible and dispatchable resources, batteries, energy storage, pumped hydro, flexibilizing the ESCOM coal fleet, um, gas, uh, a whole range of, of different options. It's not just about renewables. But it's way bigger than electricity. I mean, we're not talking about sector coupling, we're talking about electrifying transportation, we're talking about taking cheap renewable electricity, turning it into hydrogen and using that hydrogen in terms of liquid fuels production, using that in fuel cells and buses and cars, um, a whole cross, cross coupling linking of um, the industrial heat sector with the transportation sector, with the electricity sector. And all of that is starting to become very attractive not just from a climate change and a CO2 impact, but really based purely on cost and economics. That is what is driving a lot of this. That is what is driving most of the people sitting in the room, most of the customers that are starting to deploy these technologies. Yeah, sure, it helps in terms of the greening and the CO2 and the carbon credits and stuff, but at its root is finance and economics, and that, that is what is, is truly driving this transition. So we in South Africa have seen a, a large amount ramp up um, since uh, 2013 with the first uh, wind and PV coming online. Um, a little bit of our hiatus uh, in the last years in terms of uh, the slowdown in the procurement program, a bit of the policy uncertainty with regards to the programmation and, and, and the likes of the, the IRP and, and um, the, the present and, and immediate and, and, and critical financial issues within ESCOM and and looking at new market structures to be able to continue um, to deploy this kind of renewable energy because one of the key things, and, and there's lots of, I assume, bankers in the room, is that the ability to finance this is critical and providing things like government guarantees 
and standing behind organizations like ESCOM in terms of their balance sheet to sustain this kind of very capital intense um, process that renewable energy is, is increasingly a challenge. But then, as we're going to talk about today, we, we have major opportunities in terms of the small-scale embedded generation space where you, me, companies, everyone else can be, be financing that ourselves. It's not coming off the balance sheet to the state. It doesn't require those kinds of guarantees. Um, it's small-scale. It's distributed. It's embedded. It's de-risked. Um, starts to become very attractive. So what we've seen, and this is some of our recent CSR analysis uh, in terms of the, the sorts of numbers, um, this is the total of high-level estimates um, of the amount of small-scale embedded generation in the country. One of our challenges is that um, we don't really have a handle on this. I think the, the initiatives by the department and, uh, and NURSA in terms of the registering, uh, registering of, of these installations is absolutely critical. Um, we need to know about them. We need to be able to operate grids, uh, plan for them. We can see it's increasing substantially. Our estimates, there's, there's at least... 400 uh, megawatts of, of embedded, largely PV, um, by the end of 2017. In, in last year alone, I mean, at least 200 megawatts was installed. Exact numbers is uncertain, but just drive around Joburg. If you, if you have a helicopter and you fly around, I think you'll see a lot of it. The amount of um, shopping malls, shopping centers, commercial, anyone that is is running daytime facilities that also has heating and cooling loads during daytime hours is a prime candidate in terms of installing these technologies and we're really starting to see it take off. Um, what does that then mean for South African distributors? Well, one of the, the game changers with the renewable energy is not just the, the cost savings, but the fact that it's distributed um, and it's granular in terms of you can build out with good economies of scale still down to the kilowatt level um, and still be able to have bankable business cases. You don't need to build it in the multi-massive 600 megawatt scale class. You don't have to be uh, a leading EPCM um, globally to be able to, to contract it, to implement it uh, and, and build it. Um, so it can be done at different scales, um, but it's obviously variable. Um, so, so if you're going to go completely off the grid, I wish you luck. It's going to cost you a fortune. Um, and you're going to be sitting with a lot of headaches and ongoing maintenance in terms of things like battery replacements. We from the CSR don't see that happening anytime soon, and we don't advocate it. Um, but complementing small-scale embedded generation with storage, with, with the grid, with other flexible options um, certainly starts to become attractive. But it's not just uh, SSEG. We, we're living in a, in, in, in a rapidly changing world, the fourth industrial revolution, um, we're seeing new loads such as electric vehicles, which when coupled with SSEG start to, to give further uh, business models and, and business cases. Energy efficiency, uh, we're seeing it in South Africa. The first thing that people tend to do, whenever one of my mates asks me, so Clint, you know, what should I do? Should I put PV on my roof? I say, well, the first thing that you do is make it, simply make your loads more efficient. So we're going to see increasingly energy efficiency and customers reducing their, their, their consumption, which is not good for South African municipalities and ESCOM in terms of the sales and, and their business models. Um, we're seeing advanced uh, control systems around um, energy efficiency and management, and of course um, new more efficient appliances such as heat pumps. This is how our, our electricity system typically looks like today. Um, we've got centralized fleets of, of large-scale thermal generation. Um, these are, this is predominantly the ESCOM fleet, and more recently paired with uh, utility-scale IPPs, most of those connecting directly into the transmission, sub-transmission grid, with essentially unilateral power flow going down towards the Munich and the distributors, then supplying the end customers. We're already starting to see a, a major shift in terms of the structure of that industry, even with, even with our presently vertically integrated um, industry structure um, and business models. Um, we have a number of customers that are already starting to, to, to do embedded, particularly rooftop solar PV and, and small-scale battery systems. Um, and a lot of the battery systems also being driven from a, a load-shedding resilience perspective. Um, I just noticed in the estate that I live, you know, within that two months of the load shedding starting in the, in the early year and the amount of PV panels that, that went up and I and assume the batteries that, that went with that. Um, 
and as customers that can afford it are starting to 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 increase their resilience to to grid outages um, and we're going to see uh, uh, municipalities uh, wanting to procure their own uh, renewable energy based uh, uh, sources um, from within their their own municipal supply areas and in some cases they will want to be owners and operators um, of their own PV on their own buildings on their own car parks in their own um, municipal owned land so it's not just about the customers it's, it's also about the distributors and the business models around that so in the last 10 to 12 years this is the the, the price increase that we've we've largely seen across the different customer segments um, if we just look at local authorities, for example, um, a 16% per annum year-on-year -year compounded growth in the increase, and uh, the sad reality is that, that that is going to continue further with the price trajectory as per um, the committed build um, and the, the, the rollout of, of, of the IRP. Um, and that's if we do it cost-effectively and efficiently. Um, electricity has been cheap. It's now becoming priced at closer to the levels that it actually costs to produce and sadly that that is becoming more expensive and if you're a, an energy industry um, that was benefiting from low cost energy in terms of a substantial driver behind your profit margin um, that has been obliterated in the last 10 years so you me businesses everyone um, is asking the question so what what can they what can we do in terms of reducing um, these cost impacts. So unfortunately, as the, the price of grid-based power increases and the cost of small-scale embedded generation decreases, and it depends on your perspective of if, if you're a supplier of these technologies, um, it's, it's a great business case um, because increasingly um, customers are going to start to install these, um, these, these installations. But depending on, on how your, your retail tariffs are structured, um, you really can end up in what we call the, the utility death spiral, which has been seen in, in a number of jurisdictions across the year, across the, the world. As grid-based power becomes more expensive, customers start to install more of their own supply. Um, that starts to reduce the subsidies and the revenue in the system that results in reduced margins, and then the utilities increase the prices further, and so you end up in this uh, this this negative feedback loop, um, which is which is really becomes destructive for the industry. Um, part of our challenge, and it's a very real challenge, living in a developing country like South Africa, is that there's only a relatively small portion of our customer base that can do this. Um, the vast majority of ESCOM's customer base is, is electrification consumers, um, consuming less than 300 kilowatt hours a month. Um, their ability to finance and to be able to do these kinds of solutions is highly limited and they are dependent on the subsidies in the system to pay for that. So we've got a very, very real challenge in terms of how we manage this transition in South Africa. If we look at our, our integrated resource plan, um, these are just summary slides of our CSIR analysis of the IRP as is in the public domain um, by 2030. There's still a huge amount of coal, as understandably so, and there will be for, for some time in the South African system across all the different scenarios. These are the different scenarios that are analyzed in the DOE's IRP. So this is the DOE's IRP. Um, and, uh, but by the end of 2030, we're starting to see in all scenarios a significant amount of wind and PV. Um, by 2050, um, that coal is, is starts to drop off and and, in, in, and whilst there are some fairly substantive differences between each of the scenarios, in all of them, there's still a massive amount of wind and PV. So even if there's going to be further coal, and even if there was further nuclear and build-outs and whatnot, it's still going to be a massive amount of renewable energy in addition to the other technologies. We, we did some, some further scenario modeling to say, well, what if um, the ESCOM coal fleet um, continue the performance is, is, is poor um, and uh, it was coincidental because unfortunately this is the exact scenario that has started to play out and in fact what we thought were very pessimistic levels of, of coal fleet availability turned out to perhaps even be optimistic um, because with that level of performance uh, our own analysis shows 
that we're going to start to need to procure more capacity and energy earlier um, and that that would be a combination of not just solar PV and gas but also a fairly substantial amount of battery storage. So, so as we see technologies such as lithium-ion batteries become cheaper and more cost-effective based on the international trends for those new technology or for those technology costs, we're not just going to see a, a, a large amount of, of, of PV and batteries but also storage. And if you combine that with things like electric vehicles, which is itself a big moving battery, then there's a lot of synergy in terms of um, SSEG deployment that is a combination of electric vehicles, of batteries, of embedded generation. Um, and especially if you're living within municipalities where your grid availability uh, might be an issue, um, and then you're going to, to, to start to deploy some of those systems, not just to save yourselves cost in your electricity bill, but also to give, allow you to be able to continue um, with uh, your normal business um, or domestic operations. So the, my last three slides is really around the, the, de the, the deployment and job creation opportunities, and, and it really can be a, a contentious debate. Um, what we do is um, we use a, a, um, a model uh, called iJedi, um, developed in the U.S. Um, that has been configured for application in South Africa, um, and we then use that to then uh, critically analyze, based on a range of assumptions, the amount of technology localization and how that can translate into jobs um, and economic impact um, for different scenarios. So, so the scenario that I'm just going to share with you today is, is really taking that uh, draft RP 2018, uh, which includes a 200 megawatt per year allocation, which is probably conservative and and uh, based on the market will probably be oversubscribed fairly quickly. Um, so it's perhaps on the low side. Um, and you can see that cumulatively that is going to scale to almost 2.5 gigawatts um, by 2030. We've then taken that, and, and this is fairly um, conservative. It, it, it probably could be a lot more aggressive in some areas is we've looked at the different components of the value chain of, of the equipment and the supply chain for small-scale embedded generation, in this case specifically rooftop PV, and we've said how much could we localize of, say, the modules, the inverters, the installations. And we've broken it into three tranches, an initial tranche of, of relatively low levels of localization, and then we say, well, if the, the industry starts to gear up manufacturing, local content requirements start to become enforced at these levels, um, then we can very realistically scale to these levels um, of, of local supply within, within the, the supply value chain. Um, and then we've analyzed what does this then mean in terms of, for example, jobs um, within just this one small sector. So it's just 200, if we just build 200 megawatts per year, no, 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 which would be in addition to all the utility scale that we would be doing. Um, and this really is then just, I've just got these two graphs showing um, the construction jobs and the O&M jobs. So this is the construction jobs analysis. So this is showing you in each year how many jobs are created. And, and you can see that there's these three tranches. And what's changing there are those localization levels. So the more you localize, the more you locally manufacture, the more jobs you then create within that local manufacturing, for example. Um, and we break down the analysis um, into direct, indirect, and induced. So the direct jobs are the guys physically climbing on the roof and doing the installations, for example, and direct manufacturing. Indirect would be, uh, for example, indirect component supplies um, of, 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 of components um, that are also used um, locally and then induced um, is really the, the further jobs that get created in the economy because you have people with spending power. So this is the money that gets spent at the, at the tuck shops, at the malls, um, um, that simply gets created through, through creating the employment in the core sectors. So in over 2,500 full-time jobs, and this is full-time job equivalents um, in, from inception, um, growing to, to in the region of 3,500. And that's just for a, 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 a relatively small PV rooftop. What's really encouraging is that uh, you're going to get this perpetual O&M job creation that really scales and ramps um, as the installations are done. 
once again in both direct, indirect and induced job categories. Um, but by the end of by 2030, more than uh, 1,600 people employed on a full-time basis equivalent um, in terms of doing um, the maintenance on these kinds of systems. Um, so there's, there's a lot of potential, and, and one can just think about the SMME market um, and the kinds of opportunities that this creates for, for small, small uh, firms, um, black-owned firms, um, and the like to be able to get into this market, a market that is otherwise within the design of the utility-scale markets, quite prohibitive um, in terms of the sort of financing and the other requirements that would be required. Um, you could build a whole pipeline of projects and capability here that one can then also start to scale into the utility scale. So it's a massive opportunity, and I think a lot of this is presently being done under the radar, um, and that a lot of work is required now to start to, to, to really make this a reality for us. Um, and that's really it, Chris, in terms of my timekeeping. Thank you.